Welcome everybody, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are joining us from, and welcome back to the F6 Public International Law Lecture Series. My name is Dr Emily Jones and I am a senior lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Essex and I am of course also the co-founder and co-convener alongside my colleague Dr Megan Wong of the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. So unfortunately Dr Wong is currently having some connectivity issues, um, hopefully she'll be able to join us towards the end of the lecture but you're kind of stuck with me for now so I hope you're okay. Very strange doing it on my own and we miss her but hopefully she'll be able to join us later on. Um, but of course, we are very, very pleased to have with us today the very highly esteemed Professor Fleur Johns. So thank you for joining us. I will shortly um, introduce Professor Johns properly, um, but before I do so, just a couple of words about the series, especially for those of you who are new to joining the series today. So the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series is of course co-founded and co-convened by myself and Dr. Megan Wong. We're both generalist international lawyers, but Dr. Wong is a formalist and I am a critical international legal scholar. And the series is really built upon our deep respect for one another's scholarship across these divisions. The series therefore prides itself on building on these two very important intellectual traditions in international law. Formalism on the one hand and, and international legal practice on that side and critical international legal theory. And of course, today's lecture by Professor Johns, as her work traditionally does, will bridge both. So introduce, to introduce our fantastic speaker today, it's my real pleasure to have Professor Fleur Johns joining us. And she is a professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at UNSW Sydney. And she works in international law, legal theory and law and technology. She is also an Australian Research Council Future Fellow and in 2021 to 22 is a visiting professor at the U University of Gothenburg, which is of course in Sweden. Professor Johns has published four books and has a forthcoming monograph under contract with Oxford University Press um, entitled Help, hashtag help, Digital Humanitarianism and the Remaking of, Inter of International Order. She's held multiple visiting appointments in Europe, the UK, the US and Canada, and currently serves on a range of editorial boards, including those of the American Journal of International Law, and the Journal of Technology and Regulation. Professor Johns is a graduate of Melbourne and Harvard universities, and in 2020, she was elected to the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. And Professor John's lecture today is, of course, um, entitled The Digitization of Humanitarianism and Its Discontents. So very quick housekeeping. Um, if you do want to ask a question, there is a kind of Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. It's kind of Q&A with two little speech bubbles. Um, so ask questions there and you can ask them at any point in the lecture, but I'll be asking Professor John's the questions at the end. Um, you can choose to remain anonymous. Um, if you want to do that, you just submit your question. There's a little tab where you can click to remain anonymous. Um, if you don't do that, then I will probably read out your name. So do put anonymous if you don't want me to do that. So without further ado, Professor Johns, over to you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be able to be part of the Essex Public International Law series now in its second year. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Emily Jones, and also Dr. Megan Wong for the invitation. This series really strikes me as noteworthy, both for its deft and quite unusual curation of international legal work spanning formalism and critique, but also for its open celebration of academic friendship. It's, a, it's been striking to me the way that you and Dr. Joan, uh, Dr. Wong, sorry, have consistently cast the series in these terms as an expression and outcome of academic friendship. And I hope that there's an occasion perhaps at some stage for you to reflect publicly on what that entails and demands in contemporary university settings. I for one would love to hear that. But let me just start by sharing my screen. My role today is not, however, to speak of friendship, although I will come back to that, but rather of discontent, specifically the digitization of humanitarianism and its discontents. 
In speaking to this theme, I'm going to introduce a few of the ideas and arguments that will be further developed in the book that um, Dr. Jones just mentioned, uh, the manuscript for which I will be submitting soon to Oxford University Press. But this talk does not summarise the book and Freud, with whom I'm going to be thinking a little today, does not currently feature in the book. So this is not a book trailer, it's a standalone talk. Nonetheless, those of you who find something of interest or something enraging or perplexing in this short talk might like to take a look at the book when it comes out. This talk revolves around one claim. Humanitarianism is becoming digital and this is reconfiguring international legal relations. As I noted in the abstract, this is an empirical claim made on the basis of more than six years examining efforts within the United Nations system to make greater use of digital technology and data science. But it is also a polemical claim. That is, it involves problematization of the idea that international legal change proceeds along progressive programmatic pathways of the kinds that international lawyers like myself are forever laying. International law is already otherwise. It is already in this account something other than it is supposed to be. So this is where I'd like to begin with this observation slash argument. Humanitarianism is becoming digital and this is reconfiguring international legal relations. From here, my plan is to speak to a series of struggles that this makes for international law and lawyers. Some of you will know the short book uh, by Sigmund Freud, Civilization and Its Discontents, published in 1930, with which I propose to riff today. That book is, as you know, both powerful and deeply problematic, not least for its misogyny. Much ink has been spilled over and around it, and I won't do it justice today. Nonetheless, my plan is to proceed with this talk in eight parts, improvising very loosely with the eight parts of that book. This is not an exercise in psychoanalysis or cultural theory. Everything that I say here, I say as an international lawyer, albeit a somewhat wayward one, imagining myself speaking with other international lawyers about matters within the limits of our ascribed expertise and about matters that test and demand reinscription of those limits as international legal work invariably does. So, so much for plans, let us turn now to limits. Over the past 20 years or so, all sorts of people and organizations have been propagating practices that have lately come to travel under the name digital humanitarianism. Operations and institutions that we typically think of as a humanitarian are becoming increasingly concerned with trying to represent conditions using binary digits and translating humanitarian dilemmas into computable decision problems with a view to generating actionable inferences and other triable outputs. There were, of course, many earlier instances of information and communication technologies being deployed in humanitarian work from the use of Morse code telegraphy in emergency response in the early, early 20th century to the so-called space bridge to Armenia of 1989. Nonetheless, efforts and aspirations along these lines have really picked up speed since the turn of the millennium. Digital technology and data science have become significant features of humanitarian investment, policy making, practice and rhetoric. Now there's much that could be said about this turn, that's why I'm writing the book about it. But today I wanna to draw attention first to the sense of capaciousness that this brings to international humanitarian work. The accessibility of real-time or near real-time data that emanate from digital devices that are ubiquitous across much of the world, these create a sense of international humanitarian work coming in touch with something potentially limitless even oceanic. Access to digital data that may be of humanitarian utility suggests possibilities of being one with the external world as a whole and evokes oceanic feeling. To quote from Freud, 
talking about experiences associated with religious faith. The prospect of oneness often inspires hope. To some, it heralds enhancement of human capacities and mastery of chaos. It is also, however, a source of fear. It often seems to imply erasure of pre-existing boundaries and the emergence of new threats. Computer scientists from Pakistan and Malaysia writing in a scholarly journal in 2017 expressed this when they woke about, wrote about social media interactions generating, quote, a boundless ocean of data, end quote, of potential value to scientists confronting flood disasters. Patrick Meyer, a tireless champion of digital humanitarianism, has written of a global surge of caring and connectedness enabled by digital technology. He has pointed, by way of example, to the crowdsourcing of relief needs after the 2010 Haiti earthquake using the free open source MicroMappers platform. Meanwhile, ge geographer Brian Burns is among those who worry that digital humanitarianism might be having, on the contrary, narrowing divisive effects. Burns and others worry about digital technologies drawing epistemological boundaries around what it is possible to experience and to know and erecting new frontiers of philanthrocapitalism. In either case, digital technologies humanitarian deployment seems to raise troubling questions of how international humanitarian work relates to exteriority. This is the first of our discontents. Digitization purports to make people one with an exterior world in ways that provoke ambivalence. If the deployment of digital technology in humanitarian work creates a sense of the external world crowding in, it is a prospect that digital interfaces themselves suggest be tackled with vigilance and resilience. This is apparent in the various digital interfaces that have been developed to try and equip people to handle natural disasters and humanitarian emergencies. Over the past few years, I've spent a lot of time looking at a range of prototypes that international organisations have developed that try to make real-time or near real-time data available to those who want to direct resources to those in greatest need in the aftermath of disaster. UN Global Pulse, an initiative of the UN Secretary General, has for instance developed MIND, which stands for Managing Information in Natural Disaster, and Vampire, an acronym for Vulnerability Analysis Monitoring Platform for Impact of Regional Events. The World Food Program has worked with the Alibaba Foundation to develop Hunger Map Live. This combines actual rolling mobile phone surveys with projections of food insecurity generated by machine learning algorithms for countries where actual data is unavailable, all to try to equip the WFP and national governments to better anticipate and prevent famine. Now, there are very important differences among these interfaces, but there are recurrent patterns that span them too. They tend to make humanitarian emergencies everyone's and no one's business, potentially detectable by a much broader constituency via the internet, yet actionable only in relatively narrow, predefined and piecemeal ways. Everyone with access to digital data, much of it commercially accumulated and controlled, is invited to see themselves as incipiently capable of acting in and on humanitarian emergencies, provided that their capability is cast primarily in informational terms. Patrick Meyer, who I mentioned before, has written that anyone can be a digital humanitarian, absolutely no experience necessary, he writes. All you need is a big heart and access to the internet. Yet at the same time, the very profusion of data sources that digital interfaces make apparent seems to yield any number of reasons why redistributive or preventative action beyond information gathering should be deferred. There is always, it seems, the prospect of more or improved data on the horizon, some configuration of which might make humanitarian action better informed, better targeted, better received. In the meantime, digitally enabled and detectable communities are always imagined to be in the process of adapting, innovating, becoming more resilient. This offers yet another suite 
of reasons to scale back any radically redistributive ambitions in the name of self-reliance. For all the data that it amasses on the interaction of climactic and macroeconomic conditions, Hunger Map Live, for example, does not suggest that the global system of food distribution is amenable to ambitious reform. Rather, it directs policymaking attention towards near-term measures that might move selected subnational zones from alarming red to pacifying green on the interface in real time. The rhythms with which humanitarian emergencies are inflected by these digital interfaces are also noteworthy. Humanitarian emergencies are made cyclical, recurrent, and demanding of continual vigilance. No longer, it seems, is the humanitarian emergency that which suspends time. Instead, the crisis situation comes to occupy the dead, dead time of waiting. Through the emphasis that they place on continual watchfulness, a task that they take on on behalf of their users, the digital interfaces mentioned above foster a generalized sense of chronic waiting. Insofar as waiting is often identified with submission, these interfaces engender dispositions of hyperattentive acceptance, all ironically in the name of making the conditions that they represent newly actionable. This is the second of our discontents. Digital humanitarianism begets a disposition of watching and waiting in a relentless palliative present. This is what Freud might have called the libidinal economy of humanitarian digital interfaces. They offer the satisfaction of having the data right now and encourage a making do in the near term in place of any more enduring sense of security. In arguments for the fuller use of digital data and technology in humanitarian work, it is often claimed that this might make states more secure against nature and in their mutual relations. States' presumed capacity to become more secure in this way is, however, uneven. Some must be made less secure in order for the safety of others to be assured. Digital humanitarianism is giving rise to new measures of relative worth to which states and other political communities are now being held as they vie to establish and maintain their authority as humanitarian actors. States and would-be states are increasingly held to a standard of datafication in order to maintain their statehood's viability, much as they have long been held to a standard of civilization as Angie, Koskinyemi, Zubala, and others have discussed. This is our third discontent, the security that digitization promises states and other political communities is double-edged, and those edges can be lethally sharp, more so for some than others. In order to ensure their population's security, states are now expected to work continually towards datafication towards ever greater data access, accumulation and control to report against SDG indicators, for instance. As datafication becomes a, condition, a precondition for security, those states that do not meet it are increasingly beholden to others that do. Some states inability to marshal enough data on or from their people or territory gets treated as a mark of those states unwillingness and inability to govern. This may be used to justify even more intrusive surveillance and data gathering on that state's territory, sometimes combined with military force. In these and other ways, states that fall too easily, that fall, sorry, fall short of the standard of datafication, all too easily get trapped in a downward spiral of digital born domination. To Freud, the protection that civilization offered was a source of misery. And that is the case in very different ways for the security that datafication promises because of the uneven effect of the standard of datafication. One of the main endeavors of civilization is to bring people together into larger unities, wrote Freud. So too with digitization in the humanitarian field. 
the deployment of digital technology in humanitarian work does not, however, simply tie people into pre-existing unities. Digitization redirects humanitarian relations into configurations that depart from those on which humanitarian work has long been premised. Humanitarian work has been oriented, for instance, around the governance and subsistence of populations. Yet digital interfaces orient humanitarian efforts towards digital aggregates that are not population-like in their makeup, at least not always. Populations have traditionally been assembled for humanitarian purposes using statistical techniques employing representative samples through survey methods, for instance. The analysis of digital aggregates for humanitarian purposes does not, however, typically entail use of data that has been purposely, systematically or randomly sampled. Digital humanitarian work tries to tap non-traditional sources such as supermarket scanner data, anonymized mobile phone data, satellite image data, social media data, and so on. The object that comes into view when attention is directed towards these sources is a composite mobile aggregate. That aggregate is marked by whatever properties may be inferred from digital data incidentally generated by online or remotely detectable activities much of it elicited for commercial purposes. Digital aggregates are not more artificial than populations as topoi of humanitarian governance. They're simply assembled according to different logics. Digital aggregation adheres more to logics of segmentation and modularity than it tracks the contours of biological life or political organization. These aggregates are sorted and sort themselves for humanitarian purposes, but into classifications that may become visible only ex post rather than ex ante. This is the fourth discontent that emerges from the embrace of digital technology in international humanitarian work. Digital aggregation groups and ranks in ways that are often not contestable by those with a stake in these configurations. Group making digital humanitarianism does not just diverge from received practices of the same, it also makes differences of an increasingly granular kind around which people are likely to have difficulty organizing. A recent brief from the Asian Development Bank championing the harness, harnessing of big data in post-pandemic Southeast Asia, for example, emphasized how alternative data sources such as satellite images and mobile phone data provide granular estimates to better capture the prevalence of poverty. This betrays a tendency of digital humanitarianism to encourage a variant of what Freud termed the narcissism of small differences. That is, crafting group cohesion by reference to ever more granular distinctions among groups and group members. Freud used this term with reference to interracial and interethnic tensions. In digital humanitarian settings, however, it captures how digitization makes previously inconsequential distinctions material in ways of which the members of the groups in question are often unaware. What is made actionable at the vampire digital interface is exemplary. The stated aim of this tool is to better target assistance from government and international organizations to vulnerable populations affected by drought, initially in its prototypes in Indonesia and Sri Lanka. The vulnerabilities on which it invites action are not, however, any instances of hunger or poverty. Rather, it directs user attention towards a rather idiosyncratic conception of vulnerability, that is, the incidence of small scale farmers living below or close to the poverty line and without irrigation, located in areas affected by rainfall anomalies. To turn poverty in an, into a computable problem using the various types of digital data available, Vampire thus signal, singles out a particular subset of the many poor and vulnerable people living in rural Indonesia and designates these priority areas by highlighting them in the darkest, warmest areas at the colors at the interface. In so doing, Vampire narrows users' aperture of attention 
to only a fraction of those demonstrably vulnerable to food shortages and food price increases triggered by drought. According to the Asian Development Bank for the, um, using data for the 2017-2019 period, 9% of Indonesians were undernourished. Faced with the many critical problems of food insecurity and undernourishment confronted by Indonesians, Vampire makes a relatively narrow selection of these tractable. It also translates their plight into a problem of data deficiency, precisely the problem that Vampire is set up to address. Freud wrote of the narcissism of minor differences as a phenomenon underpinning the animosity between people with much in common culturally, the English and Scots, for instance. Yet unlike those that Freud referenced, the differences in neediness in which digital interfaces like vampire trade are not of a kind around which social and political communities have organized historically or might yet easily organize. That is because they are often not visible to the groups in question or, or not continuous with other political mechanisms of distinction and affiliation. As Tao Fan and Scott Wark have written in a great recent piece in Big, Big Data and Society, digital technologies tend to create non-visual grounds for a novel racializing logic. Similarly, in the case of vampire, what is created is a novel non-visual logic of differentiation among the economically disadvantaged who might otherwise envision themselves as allied or in a common political predicament. This is the fifth of our discontents. Digital humanitarianism makes much of differences not readily amenable to legal or political organizing. Insofar as digital interfaces developed for humanitarian purposes seek to bind people together, they are, as is apparent from the vampire example I just discussed, often controversial in those connections without making them open to counterclaim or contestation. To Freud, this might have seemed expressive of a death instinct, an instinct destructive of social bonds. Whether or not one subscribes to this diagnosis, it is the case that humanitarian digital interfaces make at least some of their constitutive relations hard to confront, even inaccessible to experience, while making other relatively sticky bonds seem erasable. In digital data structures designed for commercial segmentation, in the case of mobile phone data, for instance, or for remote comprehensiveness when it comes to satellite data, it can be hard to forge or enliven bonds other than those prescribed by the digital formats and protocols in question. The vampire example showed this. It's also evident in the Missing Maps Project, a joint initiative of the humanitarian open street map team, a US registered not-for-profit and three other not-for-profit organizations. The aim of this project is to put the world's most vulnerable people on the map by mobilizing remote and local volunteers to help create open source digital maps of human inhabited areas that are unmapped or undermapped. Volunteers are encouraged to use a suite of digital applications developed specifically for these purposes. The resulting maps are then made available via the free and open flat platform OpenStreetMap. And the database structure and editing software of OpenStreetMap inform and structure their makeup. The maps generated by each initiative of the Missing Maps Project may be illuminating, but they draw little or no attention to questions of jurisdiction or to discrepancies between underlying temporal and spatial scales in the source data. The undermapped are depicted, but not in ways that suggest how their condition as such might be connected or differentiated. This is the sixth of the discontents to which digital humanitarian practices are giving rise. When trying to connect those in need to those with resources, digital interfaces neglect relations that bear on prospects for redistribution. Much emphasis is placed in the practice and talk of digital humanitarianism on how digital interfaces might support the better targeting of humanitarian assistance. Digital interfaces do not, however, just enable, they also discipline or maintain what Freud called internal authority. Digital interfaces designed or deployed for humanitarian purposes 
generalize an expectation for action of certain kinds and create roots and rules for that action. One way that they do so is to cast possession of information as more or less equal to action taken on the basis of that information. Freud observed that bad intention and bad action are equally capable of inspiring guilt. In the context of digital humanitarianism, want of information seems often to be equated with bad action. Conversely, the mere possession of information is often treated as evidence of progress on the part of humanitarian professionals. Having the information at hand, thanks to a digital interface, is often a source of confidence, even without regard to any particular use to which it is put. Users of digital interfaces are, for example, often encouraged to feel as though they are working towards attainment of the sustainable development goals simply by interacting with the digital interface. For instance, when announcing to its subscribers the World Food Programme's release of Hunger Map Live, that's the WFP Alibaba interface that I mentioned earlier, an organisation called SDG2 Advocacy Hub that coordinates global campaigning to achieve SDG2, the goal to end hunger, characterised that interface as, quote, a tool for timely action on food insecurity. This is the seventh of the discontents that digital humanitarianism fosters. Digital interfaces train users to treat information as a paramount good from which agentive possibilities automatically flow. At the conclusion of civilization and its discontent, discontents, Freud wondered if some civilizations, possibly the whole of mankind, might have become neurotic. That is, he wondered if people might have become unconsciously invested in the management of deep anxiety emergent in all sorts of seemingly automatic behaviours. He did not, however, answer that question. Freud did not express an opinion upon the value of human civilization. Indeed, he stated categorically that he would offer neither prophecy nor consolation, even though he wrote, that is what all people are demanding, the wildest revolutionaries no less passionately than the most virtuous believers. This is the eighth and last of our discontents. Digital humanitarianism stokes appetites for prophecy and consolation, but does not in the final analysis appease them. In April 2016, journalist Erin Blakemore reported in the Smithsonian Magazine on actions being taken in the aftermath of a magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Ecuador. Since 1970, writers and editors of the Smithsonian Magazine had sought, in the words of its founding editors, to peer into the future. That is what Blakemore purported to do, to invite the magazine's relatively affluent, mainly North American readers, to envision and imagine themselves playing a role in the future of humanitarian response in a digitally connected world. Blakemore wrote, in a less connected past, people really were powerless to help unless they donated money to humanitarian response efforts or made their way to stricken areas themselves. But in a digitally connected world, there are other options, some of which are as easy as looking at a few maps. The gesture may be small, but every tag helps, even if you never leave your seat." End quote. This is the kind of future that digital humanitarianism prophesizes, a world where some are made to feel more powerful without ever leaving their seats. Tremendous growth in data and processing capacity makes the failure of human mastery seem intolerable. There are no more excuses, it seems. And yet failure is apparent everywhere. Digital interfaces keep showing up acute unmet need and transmitting urgent pleas for help. To deal with this, Failure is displaced onto the system, and the answer is always gather more data. Gather more data, gather more data. This is the anxious refrain with which we tend to greet ever mounting evidence of our collective deficits and destructiveness. Gather more data and imagine ourselves to be inhabiting a digitally connected world, a world in which small gestures give rise to great powers. These powers are pre-formatted and pre-owned in many ways. 
and yet they are not fully determined. Digital reconfiguration of international legal relations is underway. We haven't yet seen all the configurations to which it will give rise. The world is cracking, which takes me back to where we began, to friendship. Dr. Megan Wong and Dr. Emily Jones talk of their work on this series as the work of friendship. They put things together that don't usually travel together, formalist and critical work in international law, for instance, and they make that to census their workspace. They don't try to reconcile or synthesize. In a small but significant way, they are enacting a reconfiguration of relations, a remaking of discipline. The world is cracking and there is light as well as darkness between the cracks. There are lots of points of entry and there are many people with whom to probe those cracks. Humanitarianism is becoming digital and this is a source of discontents that no data can quell. Well might we ask, as Freud did in 1930, at the end of his book on civilization, who can foresee with what result? Thank you for listening.